um, all of our guests that have joined us today. So you've joined us for our International Women's Day panel. Um, and we are going to um, celebrate everything to do with women um, and uh, and talk about, obviously, um, you know, the uh, how the laryngectomy or tracheostomy um, has impacted on us as women in particular, um, but just other things as well in general. So welcome. Um, those of you that have joined us as guests, um, your cameras and microphones are switched off um, at the moment. Um, what um, the session is being recorded as well. Um, so um, if you do want to look back at it at a later date, you can do, of course, in case you miss anything. Um, there will be um, opportunity for questions. So if you do have a question as we go along that you'd like to put towards our panel um, or indeed towards us, the organisers, um, then please use this uh, the chat to put in questions. And at the end, depending on time, if there is time and you would like to um, actually ask us um, a question, we will um, hopefully have time for that. But if not, pop it in the chat and we'll hopefully deal with it as we go along. Um, so um, we'll just uh, move along our slides. So it's just a disclaimer to say that this presentation is a corporate presentation from ATOS Medical Group. Nothing in this presentation provides any diagnosis, clinical advice, indication, guide, warranty or guarantee. Nothing in this presentation can substitute individual advice or guidance from a qualified healthcare professional. Um, you must see your clinician or qualified caregiver for advice on your condition and on products that may be appropriate for you. Hello, everyone. So your hosts today are from the nursing service. So it is myself, Masvita, and Charlotte, who has just been speaking. And you might have seen me at home because with the nursing service, we've got field nurses and we've also got the best at nurses who are office based. So myself, I cover what we call T6. So I work from York all the way down to Lincoln. And we do have other nurses covering everywhere around the UK. And I don't know if, Charlotte, you want to say anything about yourself or Best Start Nurses? Yeah, so I'm one of the Best Start Nurses, so I'm um, office-based. Um, so you may chat with me um, usually during the first six months of your um, time with ATOS when you've, once you've been registered. So we offer you support remotely, help you with the ordering process, etc. cetera. Um, there are four, four nurses altogether and we cover different areas. So I cover um, the Midlands um, and I also cover um, the east of the country um, and as well as the northeast. Um, and my colleagues cover the other sort of areas. Um. Sorry, she's calling me. And on our panel today, we've got really phenomenal women um, that you can see here. And I'm just going to let them introduce themselves. So if you can just tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and maybe a little bit about your condition as well, how long you've had your tracky or your larry, or anything interesting you want us to know about you. So, Christine, shall we start with you? Is that okay? Me. Yay. I had um, tongue cancer in 2018, and uh, I ended up having um, six weeks of radiotherapy and two months of chemotherapy. It got to the point where I was on my last session with my clinician and I felt something and I ended up having another lump. This time I wasn't so lucky. The trouble was the cancer was too far down my throat. 
and as a result, I had to have a laryngectomy because I didn't, I couldn't have eaten um, everybody did their very best for me and this is where I am today. I am so happy I'm still here. Absolutely, yeah. And, I don't and, know today. I mean, it's such a shock for everybody. Nobody realises what a blow it is. But I think you've got to just embrace life and carry on. Yeah, good for you, Christine. Thank you for sharing. Um, Marcia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. I work in the NHS as admin. I found out, um, I think, five years ago in April, I'd been going to the doctor for a year. I just thought it was just, you know, a sore throat because I didn't have any symptoms because I went on holiday and I couldn't breathe when I came back and I had to go to the doctors. And then when I was in the doctors, I could see the flashing blue light and I was going like, who is that for? It went me and I went, really? And it was like I was rushed to us because they were doing all these tests and they could not find why I was talking the way I was talking. So what they said, they'd have to do a biopsy. And you know, when you hear that word, biopsy, I just broke down and was going, no, no, no. And even then, you don't think, well, I didn't think, I mean, I smoke, but I'm not a chain smoker or anything like that. So no way was I thinking it would come back positive with cancer. I was broken when I first heard. And then the consultant went, stop that crying. You're going to leave. And I think... From she said that, I just thought, I'm going to kick butt. And I've done that since I've found out. And it's like, you go into hospital, they remove it. Then they have to find that, you know, if it's bread and everything. And, you know, like, it's a journey that you take when you have to go to the dentist to check your teeth. It's like, people don't understand. It's like they said, oh, you can't go swimming because you'll drown on you because... I tell you, it took me a long time to have a shower because I thought if the water gets in there, I'll drown. Yeah. And this was the thing. It's like a new way of life because you have to pack a bag like you know, children and you pack the nappy bag. It's like you're packing your throat bag. And yeah. That journey where I've got used to it now. And because I was someone who loved holidays, I was thinking, how is this going to work? With me going on holidays, I was thinking, is my life stopped? Can I get on the plane? What will the temperature be on the plane? And it was things like that. But I'm telling silly you. Things, silly things you worry about. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Like, it's been my best life, you know. I know it sounds weird, but I've just arrived and, you know, do what I want. It's not like the only time I remember is when I look in the mirror and say, oh, yeah, I've got a hole in my neck. Or otherwise, it doesn't seem like anything's really changed. No, that sounds weird, but that's how it is. Good. Good. Thank you, Marcia. I remember asking my surgeon, will I be able to sneeze? <laughs> and she said to me, I don't know. <laughs> and now he said things <laughs> like that. <laughs> what be about? Yeah, it's really nothing to worry about, but it's it's things you think, oh gosh. Yeah, this is my life now. What do I do? Okay, thank you, Shirley. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Shirley. Um, I only um had my laryngectomy just over two years ago. And like Marcia, I had no symptoms. Um, I went to the doctor a few months before because I had what I thought was laryngitis. And um, anyway, they to cut a long story short, I had various scans 
no, there was nothing um, sinister at all. And then I went in for a routine checkup. And um, a little bit like Marcia with the blue light, I was actually in hospital because I was seeing my consultants or the ENT team. And they basically said, well, you're not going home. And I went, what do you mean I'm not going home? Um, you've got breathing difficulties. Um, we're doing an emergency tracheotomy. We won't do it this afternoon, but first thing tomorrow morning, up you go to critical care. And that's where I ended up. Um, they took a biopsy after my tracheotomy and said to me two weeks later, we don't know how to tell you this, but um, you've got cancer. We can't see it, but we know you've got it. And uh, we're operating on you in two weeks time. And so a seven week stay in hospital, uh, tracheotomy to start with, laryngectomy afterwards. Um, yeah, and that was all during COVID. So wow. family couldn't see me. Um, my husband was allowed in once I got the cancer diagnosis. But yeah, I didn't have time to um, process, really. I ended up being stage four when they found it. Um, but when they went in to do the laryngectomy, they had told my husband that um, they still couldn't see the cancer. It was all up my um, carotid artery, um, etc. And um, I think I had lots of little ones rather than a big tumour. And um, basically they said to my husband, it will depend on what we can do. We will do the best we can. And if we can't do anything, we'll stick her up and then we'll treat her as much as we can. So the longer the operation went on and I ended up with a 10 hour operation, the happier my husband was because he felt that they were able to do anything. And as far as I'm aware, I am clear of cancer now, but I have a laryngectomy to live with. And like Christine, I am just delighted to be alive. I have had a granddaughter since this all happened. And if I wasn't here, I wouldn't have seen her. Absolutely. Gosh. So, yeah. so they're a different type of journey. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Shirley, for sharing. No OK. And then um, we'll move on to our other two ladies. Um, so, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? I am. Um, I'm OK. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm very shy, too. Okay, oh, bless you. Don't yeah. worry. Just do what you feel comfortable. Once I start talking, I won't stop. Um, <laughs> yeah, so for me, my journey it started, uh, I I thought it was my wisdom tooth. Um, I felt a small little lump in, in like my throat when I could swallow, but touching there was nothing there and swallowing, it was my new back, not even the size of a pea. So I was Googling it and I thought it was my wisdom tooth and I was going to the dentist backwards and forwards. And then... Um, I couldn't, I couldn't eat anymore. So I still, I was drinking, that was fine. Backwards and forwards to the dentist, cut forward. And um, then my voice, it took to my voice going, basically to my voice changing um, for the doctor to say, all right, we're gonna send you for tests. By this time, um, it went all very quickly in the space of a month. I was going for tests, getting scanned. I found out in a very unfortunate way um, that I had cancer. No one actually told me. I was going from one hospital to another and a nurse gave me a piece of paper and it had um, said suspected cancer, blah, blah. It just had a load, load of words and I had my daughter with me. She had to uh, try and explain it to me. We were very confused. I got to another hospital that deals with throat cancer and tracheostomies and um, then they explained that they might have to, if my breathing doesn't improve, that they would have to do a surgery and cut my throat open and put a tube in there and um, basically a tracheostomy, but I did not understand what they meant. It was all blah, 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 blah. No, it's going to be okay. <laughs> in my head. Um, I had a few days stay in hospital and I was like, 
proving to them I could eat with a couple spoons of yogurt and all the rest of it, you know, trying to say, I'm fine, you don't need to cut me open. Um, in the space of that, I went home. I then met with my consultant who then told me I've got cancer. Um, they, they told me, uh, they said like the tumour basically comes like in like four stages and mine was so large it should be a five. It's one of the largest they've seen. They were offering me palliative care, um, etc. Um, I didn't understand again when they started talking about anything else. I didn't hear it. I was in shock. I went home. My fiance was watching me sleeping and not monitoring my breathing. And uh, I was apparently sleeping and I stopped breathing. So he was like, you've got, got to go. Because I'd been putting it off. I had a case ready, but I'd been putting going off to the hospital. And uh, we went in and um, there was no time for goodbyes. It felt like Holby City. Um, <laughs> I was there having this tracheostomy and my chest was a tray. I was awake. I was like, what's going on? I closed my eyes. I was like, can you play music, please? I was like, this is happening. It's happening. It's not. It's not. And uh, um, and this was all through COVID as well. So I then spent the next two and a half months in hospital um, because of there was other complications, having a rig tube, you know, because you have to eat still, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, and then I had my treatment and um, obviously the family weren't allowed to see me. I gave thanks for technology for the first time. Um, but uh, they did come to see me when I got them to have tracky training. That was my excuse to get my daughters and my other half down, you know. Um, fortunately, I've been quite capable of doing it myself because they're all fumbles and fingers and I wouldn't want them down my throat. <laughs> Uh, um, going on, it's a. Uh, I had a uh, chemo and radiotherapy, and with the radiotherapy, it left me with second degree burns around my throat. So then I had to uh, turn into a nurse on myself. The experiences when you talk about the journey and and what you go through, and 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 it's the small things. It's is this my life now? how how am I going to cope and sneezing I couldn't you can't sneeze you can't cough you can't spit <laughs> I was like get it out you know all of that nonsense um and yeah cleaning the tracky around it with the burns it was that was a different experience altogether mm -hmm. uh, but did it so I was like, okay, I can do this. And and also, I think because of COVID and whatnot, Macmillan nurses were very scarce. I didn't have no counselling. Um, a lot of everything I went through was like either crying to myself or talking to my family, but they don't really understand. Um, and I didn't go into chat groups because I was a bit shy. And, and I don't <coughs> other people's stories because I didn't know where I was at in my mind I think mentally mm -hmm. um then we've got through all of this um and I still couldn't talk so I had a um a Larnix uh, device I don't oh I'm at my sister's I haven't got it with me but I was talking like Robocop yeah put it in your throat and you go blah, 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 and it pushes the air out and you can talk um so I was talking like that for a year um, then they started talking about, because what they said with the cancer is there's, they can see something, but they can't tell if it's inflammation or active cancer, like it's so minute, but they're not going to do anything. So going forward, then they started talking about um, removing my voice box. Um, that was going to be my next stage, the major operation. Again, that sort of went over my head, but I was silent internally pumping it um and then they changed my tube my tracky tube and every now and again I was like I talk a lot and I at the beginning I said I'm shy and I am <laughs> but I do talk a lot so with this thing I all the time and before that I had pen and paper and I was like scribbling like non-stop and um they changed my tube and and I started whistling 
and making strange noises. And I thought, oh, that's, that's, that's coming from me, that is. And um, I went back to the hospital, they changed it again, and and they put, um, they were like, can you talk? And I was like, Ugh. you know, trying. I got home and I went, Ugh. and the noise came out. And then I said, and then um, boom, here I am, basically. Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay. And then lastly, Elaine, would you like to in introduce yourself? Yeah, um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Elaine. I was diagnosed, well, my journey sort of started in um, October 2019, where um, I just gone into my GP surgery um, just for relatively something, um, nothing to do with where I am now. A uh, script renewal and, and um, she noticed a lump on my neck and she thought it was like a goiter and obviously I didn't know goiter, didn't know the spelling of it or anything else. So um, I was very, very busy in my job. Um, I was marketing manager for Steneline, the ferry company in Northern Ireland, one of the marketing team and I'd been there for what, 29 years. So work kind of took priority over health and everything else. So um, at that stage, she referred me um, obviously to um, ENT to get the lump of my neck checked. I think I got the first letter in January um, 2020. I was too busy with work and I ignored it. Um, and then the lump got a little bit bigger and I was able then to move the lump up and down in my neck. Um, and then all of a sudden COVID broke out in March. And then it was kind of like a wee bit like Michelle and a bit like Charlie said, it kind of then snowballed a little bit in the fact that I then became red flagged. I was sent for a biopsy um, and everything sort of started to move. And then I was asked then to go then for thyroid surgery on the 15th of April, 2020. So my whole sort of journey was the fact that it was, um, you know, obviously they thought it was very suspicious. I was red flagged, um, but yet I was always told that thyroid cancer was the good cancer. Um, and I think they call it the good cancer because you don't have to have chemotherapy. Um, but in my eyes, cancer is cancer, but it was during COVID times and that was hard enough to deal with. So I had my first surgery, isolating, um, got my right thyroid removed came out of the hospital with a very sort of like sexy, raspy voice, but I still had vocal ability. Um, six days later, um, I was discharged from hospital after an infection. And the next day, being COVID, then my consultant rang me to tell me over the phone that it was a cancer diagnosis, um, diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And therefore then they had to then remove the full thyroid um, I then went back in June 2020 and got the full thyroid removed. And I also had a central neck dissection where some of the lymph nodes were cancerous. I came out of that surgery with no vocal ability at all, nothing. Um, and I couldn't speak. I wrote on a board for four months. Um, and all I had was maybe a vague whisper. Um, so I had extensive speech therapy from July 2020 for a good eight months. And I went right back to ABCs, vials, nines, words. I felt like I was back in primary school again. Um, for me, it wasn't so much being diagnosed with cancer because I thought I could deal with that. I was sort of thought, well, if one in two people are diagnosed with cancer, well, why is it not me? Um, so I dealt with my cancer diagnosis extremely well, but a bit like what Michelle resonated there with me, my vocal ability, my voice was my personality, love to talk, being a marketing manager, you don't stop talking, um, you're kind of presenting yourself in, in a business sense, very outspoken within my family. Um, so for me and my consultant knew it was all about my voice. So. Um, 
I was told then, whilst having speech therapy, that my right vocal cord was paralyzed. And I had numerous nasal endoscopies. Um, so the right was paralyzed, was never going to show any movement. And the left cord was showing little to no movement. Now with extensive speech therapy, I was back able to talk. But what I developed was a really, really bad strider. And I was gasping for breath. So whilst I was able to try and have a conversation, my conversation was cut by lack of breath. Um, and it got to the stage where I couldn't even go out the back door, put the bins out, I, you know, going up and down the stairs. Um, it was just a real effort and a real ordeal. Um, so for my thyroid cancer, April and June 2020, then my radioactive iodine in October that year, Strider then got worse and worse. Um, and it was actually myself that practically, well, I didn't beg, but um, I kept on asking my consultant for my referral as to what was going to happen with my breathing ability. Um, and then in May of um, 21, um, we started the conversation about having a, having the need for a tracheotomy. Um, at that stage for me, I had obviously got my vocal ability back, but my breathing just went to hell. No quality of life, really, really struggled. Um, so I kept on saying, as long as nothing happens to my voice again, I was willing to get a tracheotomy. Um, I was well versed, the medical team and the support team were amazing. Well versed on what a tracheotomy was going to be. But I think in hindsight, when you look back, nobody can tell you what a living with a tracheotomy is like. Um, I've adapted brilliantly. Um, I'm an extremely positive person. Um, I will always see a ray of sunshine before a cloud. So I think with the positivity, myself and my personality, and the goodwill of my family were amazing. My friends, unbelievable. Um, I am where I am. So I practically begged to be fixed, to be able to breathe better. So I had my tracheotomy surgery in October 21, um, and I'm now living with my life with a um, tracheotomy. Um, what was most difficult for me as well, adapting, um, I recently just accepted my redundancy after 29 years. So that was a real emotional toy. Mm. Um, because obviously living with a speaking valve, days, as you all know, um, some days are good, some days are bad. Some days your, your vocal ability will be very weak. You can blow out your valve. Um, and my lack of energy, energy since I've had my tracheotomy hasn't been brilliant. And I would have traveled like three hour journey there and back to my work every day in Belfast. So I just knew it just, I just wouldn't be, I wasn't the same person that I always was. And um, so I accepted my redundancy and that was a bit of an ordeal, but um, I've since accepted a new job. So um, I'm just gonna be doing a couple of hours in a local school and um, doing some admin work on a Friday. And they've also asked me to be their exam vigilator for summer exams in May and June. So um, that's been brilliant, but um, yeah. it's been brilliant. I, I've i never hid away um, my tracheotomy, obviously. I've never hid it. Like I've got a mountain of bibs that I could sell, I could give to somebody. Um, <laughs> A lot of people would have said to me, you know, do you, you know, do you want to cover it or, you know, like where are the little bibs? And they're lovely, but I always, you know, I kind of wear my tracheotomy now with pride. It's me. It's how I have adapted. So, you know, if you don't like it, it's your problem. It certainly isn't mine. Absolutely. Um, but people have been amazing, amazing, and support medically, professionally, friendships, family. I just wouldn't be where I am without it. So um, without all their love and support. So yeah, adapt and do it. You know, I'll be 55 my next birthday. It's not how you think life was going to pan out. 
um, my husband had two sons, um, Jack's 23, Tom will be 19, nine a few weeks. And they've adapted brilliantly as well. You know, yeah. as long as mommy's okay, we're okay. Um, so yeah, just keep positive, keep reading positive quotes. Um, yeah. I linked into like a tracheotomy warrior support group. I think it's American plus a bit of UK. Um, and I read, read up and sort of Google and, you know, if you have an off day or you think you have a bit of a chest infection or your druggies misbehaving, it's always good to get advice from other people. And um, I know Edtos have been amazing from day one um, and druggy specialists. So yeah, I'm getting there, getting there and just, just try and keep smiling and take the good days with the bad and just learn from it as well. But yeah, good. 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 Lovely. That's great. So thank you so much, all of you, for sharing your stories. And it's amazing just to hear the differences, but also the common similarities between all of you and all of your really strong nature, which absolutely shines, which yeah, is amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll probably move on and sort of focus on some of the questions. Mm -hmm going to say can I see Christine's jazzy HME which she was showing us before um <laughs> after Elaine just saying she doesn't hide it Christine's yeah. got a great can you hear us Christine oh you're just oh, on you're... mute <laughs> she's out some sparkles oh yeah. I can see that now yeah look that's amazing Oh, <laughs> fabulous. Oh, you're still on mute, my lovely. Just need to press the button. There we go. I, uh, I play the violin and I've got a concert coming up on the 25th. Ah. Wonderful. I knew that everyone's well, to be honest with you, they're going to look at me because I'm playing all the right notes in all the right <laughs> places. I play the violin. That's fantastic. And that, it got me a little bit worried that everybody would be looking at my throat. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make a statement piece. Yeah, if you good deal. It, it. It's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. You could uh, set yourself up with a little business there, I think. Yeah, you could. <laughs> when really, I just thought I'd just do this to empower women. It's, mm. We're talking about International Women's Day. Yeah. yeah. We've all got a problem with our voice. We've all got a problem with people looking at us, whether we're in the shopping queue, mm. the turn around, the, what, what sort of a person's got a voice as deep as that. Yeah. And you've got a man. Um, we've got to embrace the fact we are still women. Yeah. My my problem is when I cough. I tried, went on a bus the other day and I cough to clear my throat because I don't have to use my machine as much now. And the people in front of me quickly put masks on. <laughs> and I thought, well, what can I say? I'm trying to clear my throat, you know. I, yeah. I wanted to say it's not because I've got germs, but I thought I'd leave them to it. Uh, I no, think I, I think Michelle, since um I was having it, I think um a tissue has become your best friend. Oh yes, definitely. Under there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do travel. Like we we're all so worried about what people are gonna say. And it is rather embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had it in the in the queue in the supermarket. Somebody says to me. And they talk to me as if I've had a laryngectomy, not a laryngectomy, but a lobotomy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, isn't that a lovely jacket you're buying? <laughs> Come on, yeah. girls. Yeah. But you know what it is, Christine? Christine, I think it's because people don't know. There's not enough learning. It's lack of knowledge with people. Lack of knowledge. It is an act of knowledge. And also, we've got to forgive those who don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. But on the same point, it can be so annoying. Yeah. But you know what, Christine? You, you, should, you should call it your superpower. I have little nieces and nephews, and I call it my superpower. I just say that I'm their superhero. I used to do that with my toy, with my Lionix toy, when I, um, especially with little children in the supermarket or somewhere, you know, when they're crying, and I'd, I'd say, what's the matter with you? And be like, <laughs> that I stop crying. Their mums be like, "Thank you," and we, and then I start talking about what I'm going through. So it kind of um, it educates people at the same time, you know. Mm. Yeah. So it, yeah, it was such such fun. I kind of miss it. Yeah, but they are talking about removing my tracheostomy, and I will say I am a bit scared because I've lived with it for two years now. Um, the thought of it going and me, I don't know, not being able to breathe or have a breathing problem again, and then they have got to go through the whole trauma of them reinserting it. Mm. I, I don't know. I know it's great. It's very, very scary. I don't know. Yeah. You'll be yeah. fine. You'll be fine. I think so. Your doctors, you will be okay. Everybody's okay. Yeah. Think of everybody else. Yeah. This is giving me hope, I will say. Good. Good. Well, just touching on what everyone was talking about, the changes to the voice and just the way we look, which is quite important to us as women. Prior to having your procedure, looking back, do you remember having conversations with your clinicians, be it surgeons or nurses, about how things were going to change? I don't think. Sorry, sorry, Chris, do you go on ahead? No, sorry. Sorry. Um, no, okay. I don't remember. Oh, Grant. Um, I, I don't actually think, to be very, very honest with you, um, I know, obviously, with the prior to, they always saw the sort of the thyroid cancers not being the worst of the cancers. Therefore, then, whenever you have a cord that paralyzes and you're like riding on a board and you've no speaking ability, I think for the consultant, it was more or less, you know, getting you to speech therapy. And that was all done via Zoom because it was obviously COVID times. Um, but I think for the tracheotomy, there's no, I don't, I think there's a lack of knowledge with regards to why they prefer you being life adapting, life changing. I don't know whether there's enough white, you know, it's going to be a tube in your neck. I don't know whether there's enough sort of like as to how you're going to look for a woman changing your appearance, your physical outlook. Um, it was a bit like what Christy was saying earlier on, you know, you think then suddenly once you be either the autumn or well, people only ever see your neck and not your face anymore. So I've never hit it. In all fairness, I wore the medical bands right up until my sister got married last August. And I befriended a lady on an American um tracheotomy site and she made the little beads the little necklaces so i ordered with her to suit the color that i was wearing black and white so i ordered a black one with her and then since then i've had another local um jewelry maker make tracky beads so i think wearing the tracky beads like a necklace you then don't look as sick medically with the big medical bands. So mm. I see my tracky um, consultant 
every five weeks for a jupe change. And it's funny, they actually said to me now, would you like me to put your necklace back on <laughs> as opposed to a white tube? You know, your white bands. Yeah, yeah. So, like, as you say, Ms. Vida, I don't think there's an awful lot of prior as to how you're going to look. Because I think there's a fear factor. Mm. We're trying to prepare this, this lady, this woman, this patient um, for something major. Um, so that I think they deal with it from a medical point of view and not from a physical as to how yeah. you're going I, I agree. I think, um, you know, they told me about wearing scarves, etc. if I didn't want to wear this, but that's great in the winter time. But summertime, you know, you want to wear a vest top. You want to wear an off-the-shoulder little dress or something, you know. Mm. And that that just doesn't work. And I did worry about that. But um, I'll admit, once the sun came out and I got dressed, I didn't care because it's part of me. And, you know, crack on. Mm. But it, they don't tell you about that kind of thing at all. It's not enough awareness. It's hard. No. And so how did you sort of, did you discuss things with your family about these possible changes? Were you aware of these possible changes then? Um, with I can't. It, it just happened so quickly that no mm. chance to us anything can, it was either that or die. So there's no option, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, you were obviously, Michelle, you were like, um, was either like, um, but in the thick of it, like sink or swim sort of thing. For me, the fact that I had sort of like, the strider was so bad. My vocal ability had come back, not, not to 100%. It was maybe back at about 60, 70%. Mm -hmm. um, but because I was gasping for breath, it was kind of like, you know, how are you going to fix me? Yeah. So from my initial appointment from the May, and then I had my tracky surgery in the October, um, they brought the tracking team specialists and ENT were fantastic. They brought myself, my husband and some of my family oh, in wow. to talk about how life adapting and changing a tracheotomy was. Mm. They showed pictures, obviously, you know, the tube in your neck and how it works and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think anybody can prepare you for the physical because even when you're in rehab after your surgery and your friends see you for the first time and your family, you know, I think they're just crying. You know, there's tears shed for who you once were. Yeah. But now there's happy tears as to how far you've come on your journey and how you've embraced it. It's the new you. Other mm -hmm. people can like it or lump it because I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm living it. Exactly. So, you know, you can either cover it up with a scarf if you want. As Michelle said, in winter, yeah, it's nice to keep warm and snuggly and everything else. But summertime, like for my sister's wedding last year, I wore a deep V jumpsuit. I didn't even cover it up. And that was a major family event with photography, videographers, everything. So, no, I'm not going to hide it. It's me. It's me. So, yeah, yeah. No. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. And of course, as women, the way we view ourselves, it changes from time to time and from day to day. I mean, if you think of how you perceived yourself as a woman at puberty and how you perceived yourself after certain events, like let's say childbirth, it's different. But for you, I suppose it has changed now that you're breathing from here. So how would you say the way you view yourself as a woman changed after you had your procedure? Um, Michelle, you can start. Um, wow, I, how did I view? Uh, I, to be honest with you, um, I did have, I, while I had my down days, I didn't, view myself any less I think um having the whole cancer in itself um because I had extremely long long hair really thick mm. I shaved that off myself to empower myself but I think looking emancipated and all of that that just took its toll in itself but as being a woman um I was constantly reassured by my uh, by my family 
just how beautiful I am. And to be honest, I also, through with my tears, I still never stop smiling, you know, and, and I'm a very positive person. So I feel, um, I, I stay strong as who I am as in a woman. Um, I don't feel like it really made me uh, look at myself in any negative way for myself. Like, not really, no. The whole, the whole of this experience um, did have me going, but no, I, I, I don't know. I stay, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I, 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 sorry, I'm going to waffle. I will let someone else talk. But I don't think it, yeah, I don't really feel like it affected my actual womanhood as such. Good. Yeah. Maybe stronger. Does anyone else want to share their viewpoint? I don't think I felt any major changes in me as a person it affects some of the stuff that i did or i do um i was a swimming teacher by profession and i had retired like 2019 um and it i i suppose the worst thing i find it is upsetting that i can't swim anymore which is something i was doing three times a week even into retirement and i was teaching five days a week um, and now I have a, a granddaughter and I can't teach her to swim because I'm not safe in the water anymore. Mm. Um, that's difficult. But as a, as opposed to my womanhood or how I feel about myself, generally, no, it's not made any difference. I suppose on really bad days, then I feel really miserable about it. Um, but like everybody else, I think I'm a fairly positive person. I had to get, I didn't have any option, like Michelle, I didn't have any option. I had to do what, what uh -huh. I was recommended. And it all happened in the space of seven weeks. And then, then the radiotherapy, etc. So yeah, and it was all during COVID as well. So it was, um, suck it up and get on with it. Yeah, like I often wonder, you know, the fact that I sort of, um, for me, whilst all the team talking today, like it was a needs must, and I think both yourself, Shirley and Michelle, um, the suddenness of it um, must have been quite grueling and challenging for you. I think for me, whilst I find it still extremely challenging, um, at almost 55 years of age, I had like from May, until October to come to terms with. Um, I don't think, to be very honest with you, I've often gone into my consultant afterwards because um, it took a little bit of adjustment for the size of the tube and um, there was further scans afterward just to make sure that everything was okay and the cancer was all gone. Um, I still don't think, I still think it's a superpower in the fact that nobody, not nobody, can tell you how you're feeling or what it's like unless you're a neck breather yourself so not that not that you're asking for sympathy or understanding or whatever because most people give it um but you know if you're gonna have a, a day a bad day or be off form i just call them duvet days and um, my family just know elaine's not in the form she's getting it rough you know Either my draggy sore or sticking valves cause me a bit of bother, or I just, you know, go under it or whatever. But I just try and do as best as I can. And because I'm from such a big family circle and friendship circle, and um, my husband used to say, or still says, that I'm keeping all the local cafes open because I'm going out for coffee and not much coffees and lunches and all the rest. So no, I don't think as a woman that has changed me. Um, but I would say maybe from a sort of like a partnership relationship thing with your husband, you're probably thinking, you know, um, you're probably, you're not that far away from a tissue or maybe you can feel maybe a bit of, you know, breath back or um, you're probably a little bit more conscious that 
your physical ability, your physical, physically you've changed. Mm. But deep down for me, I'm the same Elaine that I always was. Yeah. As a partner and as a husband, a wife, a mother, a sister, a daughter. Um, yeah, I might be a neck breather, I might have a tube, I might look physically different, mm. but I'm still me. I'm still me. Good. Yeah. Good. Um continuing um when I was in hospital before they released me, they uh, you know, gave me the whole tracky training, I had to look after myself. And then she spoke to me about um, you know, if it falls out and also um you know, if I'm having uh, sex, basically, and and I, I obviously at the time when I'm recovering, and that was not something that I thought of. Um, <laughs> obviously, we're all women here, so I can I can just be, you know, honest. Um, but when the first time came, it was that that in itself is a different experience. Um, because I, mean, I can, I'm better now. You don't see me suctioning away and stuff. But initially, like it, to have to suction when you're in the middle of something, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the shout. I very like ah, does he? All right, that there is. Does he? Is this attractive? No, it's not. Like a whole load of. How could he possibly want me? Like I'm a freaking quick wait stop you know like and is it gonna fall out all of these things mm. I feel like I'm gonna go red but I can't discuss this with anyone else really you know Absolutely. Um, but these are things that that definitely they go as a woman yes that affects yeah her. yes sexually yes yeah Was and I, as you said it's it's those intimate conversations that it's hard to have with a clinician that or you know that you don't see that often and yeah so no it's thank you for sharing that because I bet you probably nearly everyone on this panel has probably had you know those thoughts but just yeah absolutely and as you say it's those kind of things that you don't think about at the time but actually do have a big impact on you yeah. so yeah and I think as Michelle has said as well, um, Charlotte, you know, um, it's even sort of like even your lack of energy, you know, and maybe, you know, like Michelle was saying, maybe having to suction or whatever, you just think to yourself, oh, my God, do I have the energy for this? Or, you know, yeah, I just think as well, if you've got a loving partner, you know, and the fact that, you know, you're able to chat and talk it through and how you're feeling. Um, I think that's the most important thing as well. Because yeah. they'll always yeah. support, you know, because yeah. it becomes more about why it's just a partnership. Yeah. It becomes then more about you as to how you're feeling yeah. at that moment in time as well. So, um, yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Marcia, can you hear us? We can't yeah. see you. We can't. I don't know if you can put your camera back on. It's switched off, but we, we, um, oh, wow. we can. Yeah, we just can't. We can hear you, but we just can't see you. Oh, you can't. Well, I can actually see you and I can see my face. Oh, oh. can you? Oh, interesting. Yeah, but we, we're definitely here, but we just can't see oh. you. But do you, do you, um, do you, we were talking about, you know, relationships and, and whether it changed you as a woman and, and you know, oh, with your no, relationships? I, I'm, I think since it's all happened. I have found so much energy. I'm at every weekend party. And before, <laughs> done, it would be like, you know, you go out and you can't wake up the next morning because you've been dancing your feet. I can go out Friday <laughs> and Sunday night and wake up and it's got this spring in my bonnet. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, like, I, mean, I listen to what you were saying. Now, mine is opposite. Wow. Yeah, I have got so much energy and then and I wrote ladies, but being horny, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm thinking, did the radiotherapy do something? <laughs> I listen to what you love said and like mine is like the opposite. I think I've become more of a little tigress around there. Uh <laughs> 
Uh, well, it's good yeah. that we're, you know, it's 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 good that it had a positive impact in that yeah. way. And, you know, but everybody obviously is very different and, you know, um, but it, yeah, it's interesting to definitely hear, you know, that side for you. And yeah. yeah and yeah. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You see, I can't I don't I can't do the whole going out clubbing thing because I would have to take my um my portable suction machine just in case. Oh, like a suitcase on its own. So, Michelle, do you need to suction more? No, I suction less. I um, I I carry it with me. I'm going out for the whole day, but I don't find that I use it as as um. I can't see on my screen. As Elaine said, um, tissue is my best friend. Yeah. Yeah, but it's having it with you, isn't it? In case you needed it, yeah, for that. It's everywhere now. Yeah, everywhere. happened because yours is different from ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because like with me now, when I'm going out, I've got a little bag with my face plate, my brush, and it fits into my handbag. But normally I don't need to change it. it depends on what the club gets. If I get stuff, in, then I just go in. But I've got my disabled key anyway, because you get a disabled key, you know. And then I remember I went in the disabled toilet and there was a woman and she looked at me and discussed, but why are you using a disabled toilet? And I said, because yeah. I'm disabled. And you get them looks because yeah. people look at you and think, oh, well, what's she doing in there? And I'm thinking, hello. And then they go, oh, sorry. And it's amazing because... They're looking at you, not thinking anything's wrong, probably because the way I carry myself, where mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me. The only reason I wear my beef was because of COVID and I didn't want it going down my throat. Because I've got an aunt who actually makes me different colour beefs and like I probably wear a scarf. So I would show it because I'm proud of my neck. I really am. Mm -hmm. I've actually shown it my pictures of when I got burnt, you know, like when you have the radiotherapy. As yeah, yeah. he said, that your neck burnt it. And I thought, Jesus, peace, what is this all about? And I think that was probably one of my downtime because I couldn't eat because I'm very greedy. And, you know, your food, you couldn't taste your food. There was no taste. So I had these sweets that I would know when my flavour caught back. And, you know, when I got that flavour, I was out in restaurants. But, you know, the only thing is when we cook, I was putting too much spice in because remember, I think we lose a bit of our taste. So we're putting more seasoning in. And that was the only thing I found. I can't eat. At all, Michelle? At all. I've not eaten since I had the tracky brain. We think because of the, maybe the tumour or the damage. My, well, my feeding windpipe or wherever it is in there, it won't open properly, so it 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 opens like about five little milliliters or something like that into me inches. Um, so it allows me to drink now, but I can't actually eat. But I miss food. I can taste food, and I try my hardest. I put it in my mouth and I chew, chew, chew. But what I found, though, my total opposite. I can't even handle black pepper. It burns me oh so upset. Like. Spices like black pepper, anything like that. I used to eat. I can't anymore. It's very mm. sad. I got my mouth is like um another thing it will never be, but like a virgin, virgin taste buds. I've got everything I taste. Yeah. Taste if it's yeah. artificial or you know everything's very different. I nearly thought I went off chocolate, but yeah. So it's mm. kind of become um sort of hypersensitive. If anything, then yeah. yeah. I find sometimes as well when you're, um, you know, the way if your family and you're in the house maybe most of the day or if you haven't been out and about and then you're cooking a family meal in the evening time and you just want to chat and hear about their day. I find sometimes if I'm talking or eating with my speaking valve on or my HME, sometimes food will go out down the wrong way and you might joke. So my husband would normally say and my son, don't speak, Elaine, you know, just eat your food, but don't speak at the same time. 
concentrate. And I, yeah, concentrate and I find that, oh my God, I've been here all day, I just want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's only the days that you haven't been out and then the days that you have been out, you're that exhausted. You've no job for them. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, that's what I kind of find challenging. And the fact that, say, for example, you're eating and then joking, you know, jo- a bit of joking and then being violently sick and you think to yourself, oh God, the joys of living with a tracheotomy. You know what I mean? But it's not all the time. It's once in a blue moon, but oh, I love my food. So yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. I do, sure. I do yeah. Food, yeah. yeah, I still cook. I still cook, but yeah. Wow. It's yeah, fun. that would be challenging now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's more than anything, like you're saying. Um, it's more than eating; it's also a social thing because when you're at the table or when you're out and about eating, you're taking at the same time. And I know for the ladies with the laryngectomy, it's completely different as well, like talking and eating at the same time. So, how have you kind of like tried to find support? in terms of out in the community. I suppose you have support from your families who do understand that eating is a bit different for you now, but have you found any further support in the community now that things have changed for you? Is that to us um, or Michelle? Yeah, who, anyone, anyone? I find that I can eat anything. The only thing that gives me trouble is toast. So if I eat toast, I have to drink liver. But then I don't hate him liver. <laughs> never did, never will. No. <laughs> I struggle with some meats. I have to make sure. And believe it or not, sometimes tomatoes. Mm. And they, and, um, I find that I can't eat as much fruit as I did because the skins, um, they just irritate my throat. And a lot of salad products do as well. Um, can't eat things like rocket or anything like that. Yeah. Anything that's got a spike mm. on it. And yeah. it, it just tickles my throat and then it causes me to be sick. Yeah. Surely what I find for me... It's, it's not what I eat, it's the way I eat. Yes, sometimes. And if I'm bent over, I'm need to cough and, 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 and make myself rather sort of wanting to cast me for breath. I have to sit up straight. The trouble is, the fact that none of us now, well, we don't have the luxury of smelling food. We can only taste food. Yeah. We end up putting a lot more spice into our food. Yeah. And, and then when you cook it for other people, they go, bloody hell, that's, that's really <laughs> But we don't, we don't get that. Yeah. And uh, right when you're cooking, you like this. You can't smell it. Mm, yeah. It's a, it's a bother. It really is a bother. And you can Thank get out for it. Yeah. Yeah. So just to kind of finish on then. So if you have a piece of advice um, to help empower other women also living with a laryngectomy or a tracheostomy, what would that advice be, do you think? Is there anything specific or? I would say take each day as it comes. Mm. We don't know, like nowadays, we don't know if tomorrow is promised. Me, I've got like four holidays booked already. Um, and I'm just doing my thing. You know, I don't look back. I look forward and, as I said, when I first came on, when Mr. Jennings said to me, Marcy, you will get some down. And when I went in November, I said, I think something's wrong with me. He said, why? I said, he said, down days, what are they? He didn't explain any if I've had it. And I don't know that I've had it. 
because me, it's like I'm on an eye all the time. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking I'm a normal because I listen to everyone and I'm thinking I don't understand like what you mean, like when you talk about food. And as I said to you, the only way I know is when I look in the mirror because sometimes I'd wake up and forget that I've got a hole in my neck. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just thinking, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? Why don't I feel what other people feel? It's like I'm always on the go and nothing phases mm-hmm. me, you know, because I have to be alive. And I'm thinking, I'm looking like, where can I go next day? You know. Yeah, I mean, so you have insurance expensive, Marcia. Yeah. Oh, listen, I, what I do, I go for the bargains. I go for the bargains. Because I've been looking. Can I talk? Yeah, Yeah. go for it, Christine. I would say the one thing I regret not doing with all my laryngectomy was having people take videos of me with me talking. I would love to see that. I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, my God, they already sound like that. And I probably won't want to watch this back because I don't want to know how I sound anymore. Yeah. But one thing I think you ought to make sure of is once you've been given that diagnosis, once you've been given that, awful and it is awful sort of sort of thing where you're gonna lose your voice start writing a diary if you've never done a diary before write one i'm not talking about as i did it was with me it was all about the clinician what was going on how many trips I was on, how many times I was being fed this and that. Talk about how you feel. Write it down. Keep a diary of it and you will get through everything. At one point you will look back and you'll go, I can't believe I did it. Yeah. Still here. I've done all of this. I've had all of that. I've had all the nurses. I've had all that. But I'm still here. And she will feel great. And she then can tell everybody else how to go. It is a long journey. Mm. I would like in my lifetime to be able to talk somebody through right from the fact when they've been diagnosed to where I am now and I know I can help them. Yeah. And I think everybody on this panel feels the same. Yeah. I think it's wonderful, and- Christy. I, I actually did take a diary um, and I wrote my journey down from diagnosis until even current. Um, and you know what? It really does empower you and you see how far you've come. And you know the way people talk about, oh, you're very inspiring. You're a warrior. You're brilliant. You're fantastic. How amazing you are. And it's only when you look back on your journey. And obviously, we're still on our journey because every day is different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, God, I really am, you know, and. Whenever Charlotte was saying there, you know, I remember whenever I couldn't speak and I was going back to my ABCs and my speech therapist was amazing. She was just, she got me where I am today. Um, And she used to send me a positive quote every time after our session. And she used to always say it was baby steps and making any progress was good progress. 
And I never forget, she actually gifted me a tortoise, a little glass tortoise. And it was all about slow and steady wins the race. And I still have it sitting on my mantelpiece and I just think no truer words were ever said. Yeah. I just, when you look back and then, and all the little quote I love as well, when life gives you lemons, <laughs> make the zest of it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Shirley. Okay. Shirley. Yes. I would like to speak to you privately. Okay. I, I think you and I are going to get on like yeah, by all means. <laughs> my my advice would be that the sun always shines the day. You know, the sun always rises the following day, even when you've had bad days. Um, I am lucky enough um, that I went um, to South Africa. I've been to South Africa many times before the operation, but my husband took me back last year, a year after my operation, with my um, my team's approval and everything else. And there is a program called Wild Earth, which you may or may not do, which does um, safaris, live safaris every day. They televise. And my husband treated me to a trip on one of their Land Rovers while they were filming. Wow. And they, um, they wanted a video. And I have a video clip. Um, the Atos team have it, actually, at the moment. And it basically says, even after a year after surgery, that you can, like Marcia says, you can do what you like. You just need to take the precautions with you. And when we got to our um, accommodation, when we were in South Africa, my children uh, both know that we love South Africa, and both of them been there as well. There was a bottle of champagne, and a box of chocolates with a note from them all saying, That's been like a bottle of champagne. Come on. Uh, Mum, we know it's taken you a long time to get back, but you're back now. We love you. And I'm in the world. And so I think that, you know, you have to have a positive, um, have to have a positive slant on it and go with the advice. But the sun will always shine tomorrow. Brilliant. <clears throat> Lovely, thank you. Um, so just well, just before we wrap up, if any of our guests that are listening in, just to remind you, if you have got any questions, just please put them in the chat. You've just got last couple of minutes to put any questions forward. Um, well, is there anything anybody else would like to say? Where, where were the other ladies? Where I think Ros was. Rosamond's keen to. <laughs> There you go, Rosamond. Can you? Is that working? Was there any other ladies that, that um, we lost during the broadcast? No, we're all we're all here. Marcia, she's I'm back, back now. Back, yeah. You're back. Oh, Marcia, yeah. you might want to share about your book. Yeah, let's uh, oh, yeah. tell everyone about your book that's oh. launching. That would be great. All right. When I was in Africa from the very first day, I took pictures from going in there with the crash team all the way through because I didn't know what was going to happen. And because the children's dad had died, I thought they will need something if I don't make it through. So I, as you said, Elaine, a journal. And I took it step by step. And then I did a blog while I was in hospital. But then because I was partying all the time, I didn't get to finish my blog. But then an editor came and said to me, Marcy, I've seen your blog and I think you'd be good to write a book. And I thought, really? And then I just had notes from when I made my journal and everything. And I put it down on paper. I mean, my book launch will be the 3rd of June. Oh, wow. Good luck. Yeah, good Brilliant. Luck. People say, why the 3rd of June? 
I'm not saying because the third of June is five years to the day, really. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you know, when people go, oh, you're a bit too young, and I'm thinking, well, I'm 54, you know, even though you look and you think, I never, ever thought I'd get so cancer. Always thought women just get breast cancer or cervical mm. cancer. Mm. Yeah. Really? It was like, I never dreamed that I would ever get that. So I just mm-hmm. put it down on paper because I've been going to the doctors for a year. Yeah. And the laryngitis and I'm like, oh, no, you're too young, but you're never too young. No. <laughs> no. Well, I, I got diagnosed at 45, 46, 45. Yeah. Yeah. Rosamond, welcome. Did you have a question for the for the panel? <laughs> Are you there, Rosamond? Somebody's typing. I don't know if that's Rosamond typing or. Shirley, I'm half South African. Oh yeah, where that's from. Uh, my mum's from Cape Town. Bonds uh, from Elam. Um, we uh, we had a house in uh, Wilderness, um, about four hours out of Cape Town, uh, on the garden route. Um, but we have timeshare in Kruger Park. Uh, beautiful. Oh yeah, we're going back in April. <laughs> I'm not envious. I'm going going to see um, the film. And can you hear my voice? Again? Yeah. I haven't heard of that one. It's um, been shown in Glasgow, but it's about a, a hundred and ninety miles away from where I live. But um, if you've seen it, I think I'll I'll, I'll try. Be a nice like, uh, Try and see it if you can. I think it's yeah, gonna, yeah, a great thing to come. Bit of a tearjerker. Yes, it is. A yes. Bit. <laughs> it is a bit of a tearjerker, but yeah, it'd be lovely if you can uh, to get Make to see that in Glasgow. <laughs> oh, hi, Rosamond. Hi. hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Did, did you have a question for our panel? Oh, bless you. That's okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Did you have something you want to share or questions or? Oh, oh don't worry. It's been recorded, so hopefully you'll be able to catch up um, on the bits that you didn't catch up with. But yeah, lovely to see you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you, ladies, all of you, for joining in. Thank um, you for asking us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Hannah, have you got the last couple of slides to put up? Yes, I do. Sorry, I forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get other conversations. <laughs> I know, it's been amazing, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's <laughs> <Okay. laughs> So um, this is just, yeah, so it's just again, we've been talking about uh, the lovely sparkly HME um, from Christine. Um, so again, it's just a reminder of the importance of the HMEs um, from, you know, for both the laryngectomy and tracheostomy. Um, so it's just a little reminder really about the, you know, how important they are and, um, you know, use them 24-7 if you can. I know that obviously some of the tracheostomies have your speaking valve through the day and that's fine. And I know, um, I think it was, um, Elaine, I think you were showing us your prevent, weren't you, for at night time, which is great. Yeah, so yeah I, I even work during the day as well, Charlotte, perfect. you know, if I'm, if I'm on a non-verbal day. So they're brilliant. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Lovely. Good. Are you... I know you ladies are all really good at using it. So just a little reminder for all of our guests just to um, yeah, persevere with those HMEs and reach out to us here at ATOS if you have got any concerns or queries about using the HMEs or the different types that we have um, or that are available. 
Lovely. Next slide. So again, uh, so it's just a little reminder that we are here to support you. You've got our lovely customer care team, uh, the specialist nursing team um, that are able to come and visit um, certain areas out in the field. And of course, um, Best Start Nurses, we're all as, always available as well. Um, and then, yeah, do um, check in with our other My Life Online events and of course our online community. We've got Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Lots of interesting videos on YouTube to support you while you look after your larries and tracks. And of course, really just to talk about, we talked a little bit, didn't we, today about, you know, support, what is out there in the community. So if any of you do feel the need to reach out, you know, these are some of the, the national charities that, you know, are available to all of you um, for those additional resources. You may well have lots of local um, support in your different areas and we can't list them all because obviously each area is different but do reach out to them if you need to of course you know you've got your laryngectomy clubs as well that you can um, you know uh, interact with others but these are just some of the, the national resources that you know are available so if you do feel you've got any, need any further support then do reach out and of course, here at ATOS as well, as I say, we're always here for you. So any concerns or queries, do reach out to us within the customer care team or the nurses. Thank you. Lovely. And just really a big, big thank you for a listening in and a big, big thank you to our panel for joining us today. So uh, Michelle, Shirley, Marcia, Elaine, um, and Christine really lovely thank you so much it's been amazing just listening to so you much. and your sharing you yeah. yeah really Wonderful. great so really good support for our international women's day really lovely to have you um and we'll do it all again next year brilliant <laughs> the team for ATOS team you lot are great yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. brilliant brilliant thank you lovely wonderful support Good. Thank you. It's lovely to hear. Well, stay safe, everybody. Thank you all for joining. Bye. 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 Bye.